Good morning. Uh, I'm Glenn Morris. I'm chair of the Economic Development and Planning Committee of the Chamber of Commerce. And this is a meeting that's uh, a joint meeting of the Economic Development Committee and the Government Affairs Committee. Um, usually the Government Affairs Committee is the second Wednesday and we're the first Wednesday. So um, I don't believe there's going to be a meeting of this next week, right? Correct. Um, well, we have one subject on the agenda for today, and that is a presentation by our mayor, Jared Nicholson, uh, on inclusionary zoning proposal for the city of Lincoln. Mr. Mayor. Please, that's enough. <laughs> um, so thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, really excited to present this. We're going to talk about uh, the, the, the zoning proposal that we have coming for a council on uh, Tuesday. So this was uh, presented to the council and the planning board uh, right before Thanksgiving. Uh, we probably have seen uh, some of the coverage on it uh, in the newspaper. Uh, we had an op-ed uh, yesterday uh, for me as well. And so really excited to have this opportunity to present it. I'll give a, a brief overview and then turn it over to our uh, planner, uh, Aaron Clausen, to, to walk through the details and then, you know, uh, look forward to any uh, thoughts of the day that you all have. So, you know, the, the, the main point I, I want to make here is that this is about uh, delivering on the administration's top priority of inclusive growth. So there's a lot in this proposal that is about encouraging commercial and industrial growth. Uh, some of the changes come specifically out of the tour that, that many of you were at uh, in, the, in September with uh, some major uh, players in, in the life sciences space uh, and the conversations that we've been having all year long about changes that we can make to, to encourage the kind of in, uh, commercial industrial growth that we feel we really need here in the city of Atlanta to create jobs and to help uh, balance the city's tax base. So that's a top priority for us. We want that growth to be inclusive, to benefit residents who are here now. Uh, and our inclusionary zoning is a big part of that. Proposal. That was one of the main recommendations coming out of the housing link plan that we've been working on your to implement and uh, is also a, a priority for us from an economic development perspective to make sure that uh, we continue to create uh, places where our workforce can afford to live. One of the assets that we are bringing to these um, big companies and encouraging to invest here is not just the uh, property that we have here in the city, Lynn, but the people and the workforce. And that's a top uh, issue for a lot of those companies. And so having uh, affordable places for our residents to live, I think it's really going to help us with that. So uh, I will ask Aaron to, to come up and we have some slides to uh, walk us through the, the details, but want to share the, the overarching uh, driver behind these proposals. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Aaron Klaus and Aaron have had a great opportunity to work uh, with a strong team to pull together um, this zoning package that uh, is intended, as the mayor pointed out, to drive inclusive economic development in the city. Um, thank you, um, for pulling that up. We can go ahead and, and just jump right into this quicker. Oh, this is it. <coughs> Control it. I'm going to do two things at once now. So if I can raise this. Does work. Okay. So the, some of the, the objectives that is driving this zoning amendment uh, is to one drive and in, in sense investment in the creative economy and innovation economy with a focus on the life science sector. As the mayor said, uh, there was a, a very successful developer tour carried out a couple months ago that, that really attracted a lot of interest um, of folks in the real estate industry in the life science sector. So the idea here is to align our zoning code to drive that, that investment uh, throughout the city. Uh, and, and consistent with many of the, the uh, planning and policy documents that have developed over the past several years, um, support and investment in commercial industrial growth uh, to drive job opportunities for thinners. So, uh, 
growing a broader range of job opportunities um, for folks living here in the city. And then preserve land that is currently zoned for industrial and commercial uses for those purposes, uh, it's, instead of allowing multifamily residential districts. So, so ensuring that we preserve land to grow and contain manufacturing opportunity here. And then establishing use categories or sort of uh, increasing flexibility in them around the creative economy uh, as, a, as an economic generator and a necessary amenity to the, to the innovation, sort of the support component uh, of driving development in the life science sector. And I should say, when we're talking about life science, we're really thinking about that very broadly. We're thinking life science, but also clean tech, um, advanced manufacturing. Uh, it doesn't have to be so critical to that particular sector. Could be use your hair. Helen, do you mind seeing if you can? I could do it. Just yeah. give me the. Just there put it that way. All right. So, um, so this is washing out a little bit here, but on the left there is this is a zoning map that's highlighting the industrial districts of so the heavy industrial, flat industrial, and then the business districts uh, located out through the city throughout the city. And this first, th these first couple slides are really just highlighting the changes um, focused on commercial uses and how we're changing the zoning code to drive those objectives we just talked about. So uh, first point is allowing research and development in light industrial by right. Currently, it requires a special permit. So all those lighter gray areas throughout the city where it was a discretionary review, we're trying to make it simple uh, to drive new R&D. And that, that is really important for the life science sector, for clean tech, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and allowing R&D in the heavy industrial district by special permit. Um, currently, it's not allowed. The idea here is that um, we want to retain, as I said earlier, industrial uses and the ability for industrial uses to, to flourish in the city. And so therefore, we're, we're trying to maintain the heavy industrial districts primarily for the purpose. There may be opportunity, though, to bring in research and development to supplement the work that's happening on with that. And we want to give the council, the city council, as it does a spectrum grant authority, the ability to look at each of those on a case by case basis. There may be opportunity for growth there. And then the third point is rezone properties along Federal Street. This is essentially the market basket property and the vacant property across, across the street. Uh, rezone that to light industrial, where it's currently business. And that's shifting and prioritizing redevelopment there, again, for RD and light manufacturing uses, which is more traditional with, with that land use has been over the years. And then uh, lastly, remove residential uses from the industrial zone districts. As I mentioned, one of the objectives here is to preserve industrial zone land for that use, for that purpose. Um, and as we all know, I think uh, residential uses and industrial uses traditionally have a conflict point. And uh, most of our industrial districts already are cheap by gel by residential. It's a sort of traditional industrial sort of dynamic in New England communities. Uh, but at the very least, we want to make sure that in the industrial district, we're not introducing that conflict anymore. So we're retaining. Uh, land for industrial purposes. There we go. And then in the waterfront districts, um, again, trying to allow more uh, commercial and industrial uses and creation uses, allowing research and de development in the waterfront 1A, waterfront 3, and 4 by right. Uh, and I'll just sort of point this out um, because, again, this is a washed up. These are essentially the waterfront districts located along the central waterfront. And so if you were if you were engaged or if you've been paying attention to the, the waterfront master plan, the whole concept, the land use concept there is that the central waterfront was more of a, a commercial industrial mixed use uh, redevelopment. And then as you radiated out north and south along the waterfront, it became more residential with sort of retail uh, driven commercial. Um, our zoning didn't quite align with that. And so what we're trying to do is align our zoning code with that master plan, with the waterfront master plan. And allow for more industrial type and our research and development type uses along that central waterfront. And then allow research and development in the waterfront one uh, as a special permit. So that's these areas right here. Again, a little bit more commercial, I mean, excuse me, residential in character, but understanding that on a case by case, as you can see, research and development uh, mixing well with the residential component. <clears throat> and then lastly, allow light manufacturing in the waterfront one A and four by special permit. Again, 
the central waterfront that's that's envisioned as more of a commercial uh, reuse. So some of these amendments here are more directed to uh, supporting that, that sort of ecosystem, life science innovation ecosystem. Um, and the first couple really acknowledge that you know, for research and development innovation centers and districts to uh, flourish, they need to be vibrant, walkable neighborhoods. You think about Kendall Square, excuse me, Kendall Square, not Kendall Square, uh, Kendall Square in Cambridge uh, and in South Boston Waterfront, very walkable, very active ground floor planes. So what we're doing is we were, we're removing the multifamily use uh, by right option in the waterfront districts and, and allowing the by special commit, really focusing redevelopment that has residential uh, to have ground floor retail and ground floor commercial uses to ensure that we're creating a, a walkable, vibrant neighborhood. And the next couple bullets really talk about some exemptions that exist in the zoning now around ground floor retail. We're lim eliminating that again, seeking to drive a particular walkable neighborhood. Um, the fourth bullet here uh, talks about uh, a open space and landscape minimum uh, of 35% for most of the waterfront districts, 30% for the waterfront floor, which is the gear, the full gear work site. <clears throat> that is a very suburban, the dimensional requirement. It's not, it's not what we would see in a more urban environment, such as what we're trying to drive here. So we're eliminating that, that 35% minimum uh, and reducing it down to 10% to allow more floor area to support more growth in those districts. And then lastly, um, the waterfront floor zoning district had a, a minimum uh, height for development of 12 feet or one story. Again, it's very suburban, we're increasing that up to to three stories or 36 feet, which is more consistent with the rest of the waterfront zone. So then um, talking about the, the larger innovation ecosystem, small scale manufacturing, incubator, co-working spaces, these, these places that allow for flexible interaction among creators and entrepreneurs is an important piece of that. Um, we, have the, we have the larger players that, that we're, we're seeking, but we also need to grow a more complete ecosystem. So that's what this is seeking to do, uh, to allow that smaller scale manufacturing. We have the zoning category right now called retail trade. And essentially what that is, is it's a, it's a retail space that allows for some fabrication or making of a product on site. Um, challenge is, is uh, that there's a limitation for the fabrication component of the site floor area to be only 10%. So if you've got a thousand square foot retail space, you can only use 100 square feet for that to create something. We're, that's too much of a limitation. So we're increasing that floor area um, maximum to 50%. So now you can have 500 square feet of that thousand square foot space for making things. And that's really important when you're thinking about small scale, small manufacturing, because a lot of times the retail is just, it's really branding and sort of marketing. A lot of the, the selling takes place online. So we're trying to support growth in that space. Um, creating a new land use category for small scale manufacturing, maker space, or incubator. Um, we're calling it artisanal uh, manufacturing in the zoning. A uh, number of communities are doing this, but again, trying to drive innovation and sort of collaboration within the city. We do have some incubator spaces, we do have maker spaces in the city, we're trying to make it uh, easier to kind of work them. Um, and we're allowing them in the central business district, business districts are a four and one A. Yeah, because they're they're generally benign, so this is a bit well within the sort of And then lastly, amending not lastly, next one is amending the microbrewery um, to allow for distilleries and wineries. Um, seems kind of silly, but it is an important amenity um, to innovation districts. Like that. I'm sure you will not find an innovation district out there without a microbrewery or an distillery. Um, it's all part of the scene. So we want to make sure that we're we're filling up the, the districts. Um, Completely to support that growth. And then lastly, we already have an artist in the book uh, use category in the city, but we had not to this point allowed them in the waterfront district. We're doing so now so that you can have a wholesome um, innovation. So I zip through the economic development and all the components of this amendment really quickly. Is there any questions at this point? We can skip back to the front, but before I proceed into the inclusion zone, we'll give somebody a chance to ask. Uh, just for clarity, um, the uh, land 
the open space restriction you said is dropping from 35 to 10. Yeah, in, yeah. All right. Um, and uh, has there been steps and conversations in regards to the um, the, the port authority rezone, trying to get that kind of rezoned on a state level out of a is it, is it called a DPA or the designated port area? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, there was following the municipal harbor plan. Um, I can back up a little to give a little context in the process that goes into the decision making there. <clears throat> so. City had a municipal harbor plan that was following the 2007 Sasaki. Um, it needed to be revised because there were certain requirements built into the municipal harbor plan that becomes a regulatory document. Most planning documents in Massachusetts don't have a specific regulatory outcome. Municipal harbor plans did. Um, they shift either increase or decrease requirements in the chapter one of the process. Um, so uh, it needed to be shifted because those regulations were too onerous for preventing retail at the waterfront. Uh, so starting around 2017, 2017, there was the waterfront master plan and open space process that took place to inform MHP. Um, that MHP was adopted and signed by the secretary in 2020. And following on that, based on that work, we had asked coastal zone management who oversees the DPA to review that. Um, it's not a simple thing to just eliminate or, or to take DPAs uh, up as an option. And the, the DPA is essentially um, a statewide zoning or, or land use limitation. And the idea is that land on the waterfront that is already for marine industrial purposes, reserved for that from an economic moment opportunity, also a requirement. There's certain land uses that can't be located Elsewhere, think about it. Uh, our, you know, our plant or shipping, uh, seafood, um, or fishing, that sort of thing has to be on the water. It needs to be a water connection. So that's the intent of them. Um, they did review it and they did amend the DPA, uh, pulled Harbor Park out of it. Um, but they did identify through the process, and there's a there's a formal process that supposed to zone take um, that the rest of the DPA does meet the standard to retain it. Um, but I think that's okay that, you know, the, the water master plan talked about, again, that central waterfront talked about industrial implementations. That's precisely what the DPA is about. And I think it, it follows and supports the, the use of that area for those, those uses. And in the long run, opens up opportunity for investment for the state, state to invest in infrastructure to support those uses. One key element is um, historically, the DPA then did not include the channel, the federal channel, um, to get access to that land. Um, the change in the DPA does include. So getting federal funding in the future will be easier to, to take on the bridge activities as needed. So that's just an example of, of kind of outcomes of, of that decision making process. But I think overall, um, the DPA is aligned with, with the intent of the past with the water. Thank you. A longer answer than I'm sure you were looking for. We could talk about it. Um, all right, I'm just going to jump to the inclusionary zoning pieces of this. Uh, so, um, along with the, the overarching objective that we talked about earlier, um, the, these kind of supplement the inclusionary zoning piece, which is, you know, we acknowledge that access to affordable housing is an important aspect of resilient and equitable economic growth. Having housing is crucial for personal economic growth. Um, so, it's a component of economic development. For sure. Um, housing then has clearly defined the need. The need in the city of Maine is broad based and for households to have access to more work. And has laid out a very comprehensive strategy to meet that need, one of them being an inclusionary zone ordinance. And lastly, um, the, the housing components of this change, the, the requirements that we'll talk about, are based on market analysis, and feasibility analysis conducted by our traditional services. Um, throughout the, the housing production planning process, there's a recognition in the state of the that any requirement that's built into an inclusionary needs to ensure that a future investment in development in housing keeps continuing. I.e., the requirements can't limit the growth of investment in the city. So we balance that with the, with the requirements and back check it and then 
the market analysis, which a lot of communities don't do. And so um, I feel very strongly that we're putting forth zoning amendment that will allow for continued investment in the city and forward. So what are the components? Um, it applies to all, the, the new requirements apply to all multifamily, creating one or more units throughout the city. Uh, it creates three different, well, I should say, it does apply to subdivisions, although it exempts to the family homes. Um, it does apply uh, across three different uh, subcategories or sub-districts. Uh, the, the market analysis that our page did identified different markets within the city limits, not a surprise. We, so we have the downtown, our city, which is the zone for downtown. We have the waterfront, which includes all of the waterfront talking about one for one, one for four. And then so present what we're calling Greater Lynn, everywhere else. And the market dynamics there are different. And so we, we see different sort of uh, rents, market rents in place, the impacts uh, on the feasibility development. So we're breaking out the requirement for, to buy three districts and we'll get into sort of how that plays out and applicability. Um, but it, it really does ensure that the requirements were attuned to the unique dynamic of the city. So all new uh, housing units that are applicable under this ordinance will need to meet these requirements. Um, you need to provide 10% of the new 60% area needed income. 60% um, as we went through the housing inspection plan um, is tied to the Boston Metro region, which has a much higher need um, than the city plan. So the, the idea here is to drive down the AMI uh, so that it is affordable for more than households um, and not necessarily affordable for households in the broader region. We're really speaking to the residents, uh, but we're also reducing the amount of number of units that would be required in the project to meet that standard. Um, and that applies across all three of the, uh, the sub-districts that we talked about a moment ago. There are some design standards that, that are also built in this for the, the creation of the affordable units. They need to be dispersed throughout the, the project. They need to be built with similar materials so you can't distinguish the affordable unit between a market rate unit, that sort of thing, that are aligned with fair housing requirements at, at, the, at the federal level. Uh, but we just we articulate that clearly in the ordinance uh, so that there's no um, there's no guessing that someone has to look forward to meet. Um, briefly here, uh, projects under 10 units are, as I said, are do apply, but they create what are called fractional units. So in that case, there's an in lieu fee payment um, that is at the election of the, of the developer or property owner. I'll get into that in just a moment, but just to show you a little bit um, what we're talking about in terms of the monthly rents and household income at 60% AMI, for a single person household, um, the, max, the max income is just under $60,000. So we're not talking about we're talking about middle income housing here. Um, the monthly rent for that type of household is around uh, twelve fifty. Um, we have time utilities or not, but um, that just gives you a sense of what sort of what sort of household income that this is targeting, and the, the monthly rents that we're talking about. Yeah, we agree that. Um, I don't know if I can make it bigger, but I'll just read it out for you. Really. <laughs> so, for two households, the two person household, uh, max income is just under $68,000, uh, and the monthly rent would be $1,417 in that scenario. For a three person household, max income would be $75,000 plus, just over $75,000, um, with a monthly rent of $1,586. And then for a four person household, it's uh, about $84,000. A max income for that household, and then uh, a monthly rent is seventeen fifty five. And that in the household, you know, the household number of interest, the household incomes align with the number. So the way it applies in most most projects uh, based on HUD requirements is if it's a studio, it's assumed it's a one person household. If it's a one bedroom, it's assumed to be a two person household, et cetera, et cetera. Chris, you had a question. What about single family? Feasible. So single families aren't they're exempt from this work. So I mentioned briefly this concept of an inclusion uh, in lieu fee. Uh, so the the uh, the baseline expectation is that the affordable units are created on site to 
sure that affordable housing is made available throughout the city. Uh, but there may be certain situations where the, the dynamic development of that, of that project make that too much. So we're, we're allowing a special permit discretionary review for the, the city council to allow an approved payment adding on site units. Uh, and that a new payment is based on the uh, value gap. So the, 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 the gap between a market rent and a affordable rent for a project uh, to identify that fee. We can walk through that in a second, but um, it's essentially acknowledging that there's a difference between uh, revenue and project and it's assigning a value for it. For projects under 10 minutes, clearly it's, it's, it's a fraction unit, right? So it it's an eight unit project, I mean, 0.8 units need to be made affordable. You can provide a full unit on site if you want, but most likely what's going to happen is the developer is going to choose a payment in lieu uh, instead of providing a like, because of the cost of doing so for such a small project. Um, that in lieu fee is calculated against a fractional payment. So where the in lieu fee is in the greater Lynn area, it's approximately $70,000 per unit for you know, a one unit project, you know, project creating a unit would be around $70,000. So there's an option that seven, did I say 70? <laughs> I didn't have enough coffee. Um, so yeah, so, um, so it's a fractional, and we'll, I'll show you a little bit just a second, it's a fractional payment. So the fractional requirement, so again, the one minute example is point one. You can, you can imagine a multi-family creating 28 units, uh, the affordability requirement is 2.8, so that point eight is a fractional requirement. It's a baseline option for the developer to make a payment on that fraction, um, whether it's under 10 or not. Um, if the developer wants to make a full and new fee payment, or is again for that 28 example, um, it would be for 2.8. So there's the calculation. So, just a couple of scenarios. I already gave you one. So, if you're in, in Greater Lake or Boston Street and you're, and you're proposing to take a two fee change into a three family creating one unit. In this case, again, it's generally $70,000 per unit in greater than, um, depending on for our bedrooms, but it's generally 70,000. In that case, it would be $70,000. For a mixed use project, say in a new start of 78 units. So in that case, 7.8 units need to be affordable. The baseline requirement is seven units are provided on site at the affordable rents we saw a moment ago. But 0.8%, uh, 0.8, 8 of that fee um, can be paid by the developer. And in this case, um, it's a $182,000 uh, payment to the housing trust. And this is assuming it's on the waterfront. So the waterfront, the central business district, as I mentioned, different markets, there's a, there's a sort of a premium on the fee payment. So it's a little bit more for those those two districts. So in the waterfront, we're seeing about a two hundred dollar uh, payment for a full unit. Questions on that? Because I know that's a little. What are you giving to the infrastructure to cover infrastructure? What's going on with that? With all these zoning changes, all these new units, the school streets that probably already have that, um, as well as you know, other conversations. Yeah, so this is already. Yeah, I, I think so. The question is about the impact on public safety and the, and the school, schools, as well as you know the current you know, school agreement plan that is already at capacity, adding all these education industrial as well. Has there been conversations with these departments? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the water treatment capacity is on a, on a separate track, but as we know, with the uh, departure of Rock Barnes, I mean, that, that was one of the big customers there. Um, so there, there, there's capacity there. On uh, talking about inclusionary zoning, we're not talking about the number of you changing the number of units that are coming. We're, we're expecting residential growth to happen in the city. It's been happening. This zoning amendment, this inclusionary zoning amendment, doesn't ask how many units are being. It asks how many of those would be affordable for the rest. So yeah, so, so uh, if, if the 
question is, are we talking to public safety, school department, water and sewer about the future? Absolutely. You know, we're in the middle of a comprehensive planning process for the city's first ever comprehensive plan. Um, we're working uh, really hard to address overcrowding in the schools, which is a you know huge issue, and have made a lot of progress. The class sizes are at the elementaries are you know better than they have been in a long time. <clears throat> we're working really hard. We probably will soon over the next few weeks about the progress of the thing, which is going to help a lot at the middle school level. At the high schools, we opened a new high school at North Shore College. Um, we added an eighth grade at Lynn Tech, and added classrooms there as well, and help with overcrowding at the other. Um, Comprehensives have been using the federal ESSER funds to add portables, particularly to um, English, where there's uh, probably some of the most severe overcrowding in the district. But uh, that that's all happening. It's not it's not obviously a part of this ordinance because this ordinance is about uh, the, the the zoning and the um, inclusionary. And that's the that I do think that we have discussion. Like the needs are already kind of changing. Yeah, so if you're, if you're asking if we're talking to the school department, the answer is yes, there's someone from the Wood Public Schools team in, in, on this work. Yeah, and just to, to follow Eric's comments, the zoning itself, particularly the housing components, doesn't open up additional opportunity for new housing over, above and beyond the existing zoning. It doesn't increase density or allow additional density over and above what we have now. In fact, if, if anything, this proposed amendment uh, restricts residential housing because we're taking out the multifamily option of industrial zoning. And the, the intent there is, is it's intentional to rebalance our land use regulations with, with uh, future objectives. We need to grow in the city to provide services, all the ones you just described. Um, that new growth helps fund those services. Um, but what we're trying to do is rebalance that new growth um, with more commercial, more industrial, because we are frankly too reliant on residential. Uh, residential use. Exactly. So yeah, like if that anything, is, this or not in space, we start to solve that problem of how that time to apply to the pool that works. So yeah. we just want to make sure that the pre plan um, well, most definitely. I, I think that's partly why you're seeing this ordinance in front of you to address those issues. Correct. Yeah, so it's supposed to be 228,000 per unit times 20. That's the value gap between a market rent unit that's a, that, that would be in that project in the district. So that's the waterfront district in the scenario. So it's the difference between the, the market unit and, and the revenue of the quarterly. So there's a gap there. Um, just rough numbers. We saw earlier there that it's approximately 1400 a month for a affordable unit in the district. The market unit in the waterfront is closer to 2,200, if not more. So it's taking that gap and it's applying a cap rate, a capitalization rate, which is the standard sort of analysis that fit the place in the development um, for the um, family and comes up with a valuation. So we get 200,000. And then you multiply that by 0.8 because it's a fractional unit. You don't have a full unit there. To get to the 182,000, and, and it's going to vary. It's going to vary because that's based the the valuation, whether it's market or affordable, is based on the number of bedrooms. We again, we want to make sure that that fee is really aligned with the development in the case by case. So, just from a clarification of your two examples, in example one, the value of a single unit. Is seventy thousand dollars right? You're paying ten percent. Yeah. In the second example, the value of a single unit is two hundred and twenty-eight thousand right. dollars. That's a huge gap. Yeah. But you're paying eighty percent. 
Right. Yeah, and, and look, what we expect those, those variances. Um, in, it's not a huge surprise, yeah. but what we found okay. in the market analysis uh, is that the, the market went, and so the greater Lynn area, you know, outside of downtown on the waterfront, is much closer to the affordable sixty percent. There's not a huge gap there, and that's what you're seeing. That's what that's why you're seeing such a smaller payment for the, for the greater Lynn area. And that's the value of how, how this is structured, is that it's, it's responsive to the site. Yeah, and just, so it, that, that difference that you're going to see in the formulas, there's only going to be three different zones. Yeah. So it's center business district, waterfront, and then everywhere. These, the numbers are, are specifically calibrated to try to be responsive to the current market conditions because we want to make sure that these projects continue. So if that's the case, Obviously, market conditions change. So this is something that's going to be be revisited at least every couple of years uh, for whatever the current market rents are and interest rates. Do you know off the top of your head what the value for a single unit in the third district is? The in central business district. Correct. It's it's slightly higher. I mean, it would be higher than two twenty eight or than the higher than okay. Yeah, so it's even higher than that. Yeah, it would, be, it would probably be. Okay. It again, it depends on the So 70, 228, and around 250 is the mm. unit value. Thank you. So the 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 affordable side of, the, of that equation is every year HUD will put out uh, the maximum rents uh, for each metropolitan area. So we pull from that. Those numbers that you saw earlier are published in April. Um, they'll be updated again. Uh, May, but that's where we get the affordable side. The market rent was determined based on a market analysis. So RKG did a deep dive and essentially identifying the average market rent by district by unit type. And so we're using that as, as the market. Rent. Just later on, what you'll see later on is that there's a commitment to review the ordinance regularly um, to ensure that where we have those numbers correctly, we have them right, we're applying them. So at the very least, annually, those numbers will be because we know we're going to have any numbers every year from us. So it's, it's, just, it's, a, it's a formula. Take like that the annual market rent minus the annual affordable rent, which is going to be divided by the capital rate. Yeah. We have a question here. I have a question about adjourning. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, you got ahead of me on that slide, but that's oh, okay. <laughs> it's fine. It's totally fine. Yeah. So, um, really briefly for everybody else in the room, if, if you're not familiar, MBTA communities refers to state regulations that were promulgated by DHCD re re recently. DHCD is the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, state. Uh, it's a state agency, uh, and essentially. Any community in the Commonwealth that has MBT service or is adjacent to a community that has MBT service has to create zoning regulations that allow for transit development, essentially increasing density around that service. And depending on where you are in the region, depending on what kind of MBT service you receive, whether it's private transit, bus, computer, it changes how much how much density you allow, how much paper is allowed within that density change. But essentially, the idea is to drive more housing development in the region to address this, this housing issue that we have. Um, on top of that, uh, the HCD promulgated legislation that said communities had to limit the inclusionary zoning to 10% uh, of units that are created and 80% AMI. Um, and um, we were really surprised about that. That was a limiting addition to the regulations approximately six weeks ago, maybe two months. Uh, while we were in the middle of developing this ordinance, and we were able to work really closely with them through the mayor's office and the state delegation to amend that, allow for either deeper subsidy, whether it's 60% AMI in our case, or other communities who have an 80% AMI standard, but want to have more units created in case by case basis, so up to 50. They are allowing that, but you need to demonstrate that the market local market can play that through a study, which we did, and part of that regulation um, was amended, sort of 
flex based on our experience. We were basically able to show the state that we're being responsible. So we want to grow our is that intended to hinder how the development decision to support and supplement? Um, and they saw the value of it, they saw the intent, and now we have the opportunity to the standard both from a transit mode development and perspective. We have we will meet the, the density requirements problem statewide, uh, but also from the I think they recognize that piece, yeah. And, and just to kind of underline it. So again, median income for the Boston Metro region for a household is about one hundred twenty thousand dollars. That is not our experience. So providing um, you know, housing eighty percent of hearing median income is not really serving as it's. So we were able to show in our analysis to to DOTP and also through the housing plan um, that this is an ordinance that is targeted to see targeted city dynamics. I think they recognize the need for flexibility in the broader region. There are other communities struggling with the same thing. Uh, Worcester, I believe, is one that's looking at that. There are communities within Kari that have um, higher levels of affordability and inclusionary funding. So um, you know, they recognize that there needs to be some flexibility in that application. All they're looking for is um, justification and proof that you're not injuring the housing. These these ones are sort of more administrative elements of it, but uh, there's compliance requirements for the on-site units included. Um, so there needs to be a tenant selection plan that aligns with fair housing requirements that, that HUD promulgates. So um, we will set out the process for that. Uh, there needs to be an affordability restriction based on the property um, to essentially ensure that those units are being provide, provided as required. Um, um, we all, the second one is really important. At the very minimum, all the affordable units created through this ordinance, seventy percent would be um, made for local preference. So local owners would have first track of these units. We're going to push this up to one hundred percent. Seventy percent is the HCD intent from a policy perspective, but we believe we have a case to make both on the need, generally in the city, on the city's commitment to create affordable housing through zoning, but also through investment, through high budget, et cetera. That we are driving a broad housing policy, um, and we believe that they might support us on that. But at the very least, seventy percent of the units created in this policy will will be targeted to the residents. Um, there's annual reporting that will need to take place. I know in the city, we also want to keep all hand in the loop, all along as we move forward. Um, and implementation will be primarily uh, revolve around inspection services development at the building permit stage of the planning department. Very much involved with developers meeting the standard, and and really this is this is all sort of by right, right? Except for the in lieu fee. So you come in for a building permit, you know, you've, you've submitted everything that's required with a building permit. You should receive the, the, that permit within 30 days. Like you can, this does not slow the process. So this has been designed to move things quickly as as the technology does. Can I clarify a point you just raised? Because the in lieu payment was starred before, and then you just referenced again. So the in lieu payment for both for fractional units and anything under 10 units is by right. Correct. Anything that's beyond that, the full unit component of the, the previous example, when there's 78 units, the seven units of the 70. That's required, but can get an in lieu by special permit only. Correct. That's Thank right. you. Right. And then again, the, the, the intention there is to ensure that the affordable units are created on site. These units are available for us and not concentrated in select cases. Correct. And it's. <laughs> Yes, and the payment, I didn't say this, I think that's the point of that. So um, the, through the mayor's office, the affordable housing trust was established on the first meeting of the month. Uh, the housing trust um, is, uh, is a board of the manager's funds to um, advance programs, 
and investments to create new affordable housing and preserve affordable housing in the city. Um, and that fund is a, a tool to sort of uh, balance out a broader housing, affordable housing strategy. So those funds go to the housing trust. They can go to, to fund and create lower income affordable housing, first time home buyer program, buy program, purchase land to create, create affordable housing. So it's a part of the larger strategy that was outlined in there. We hit this one just a minute ago, but again, uh, the key point here is that um, we requirements, um, but it's also important to note that also means any changes to this ordinance, when this ordinance generally has to show that it's usable. We can't just pick a number that we want this thing, we want 20% Using support of over 60 percent in funding, but if the market can't carry that, the private developer can't carry that requirement, it's useless from a, from a sort of strategic perspective. We all along with the great ordinance that would not hinder development, but now we have this added layer of we can't do it with the house. Um, and then lastly, and I think this is pretty important, particularly. Um, um, Pretty important, particularly with the Greater Lynn uh, District, there are what we call deploying zoning offsets um, in the waterfront and Greater Lynn. There's a reduction in meeting the parking requirements um, under zoning. So, generally speaking, in Greater Lynn, it's 1.5 parking spaces. This reduces that requirement to one to meet these requirements. Um, and then in the waterfront, right now it's generally 1.5 to one. Uh, we're reducing that requirement to 0.75 parking spaces per 100, 100 units and 75 parking spaces. And that offsets the impact uh, on revenue cost for developers. And again, it was driven by that analysis conducted by our identified this was this was a very valuable offset to me. Yeah, in the in the waterfront, we're seeing we're seeing that this is aligned with what our developers are for and what the market's asking for uh, in the greater Lynn uh, area that we look towards what has been recently approved in the zoning board of appeals where we're seeing smaller conversions um, seeking variances to reduce the parking um, this just takes the, that zba process out of the equation of course but it's consistent with what we're seeing in greater Lynn in the waterfront in the downtown um, there is currently no parking required for multi family connection, uh, but recognize that there needs to be a broader conversation about parking supply. And that's a, that's a conversation we're having pretty deep in the process. A question on you, you had talked about the preferential treatment for Lynn business. Yeah. Would there also be preferential treatment if you worked for a Lynn business? So um, under fair housing, I don't think we have the, the avenue to, to do that. I don't think we can do that. It, we just, we have to really look at where, where the rest of the time. But we'll look into it a little bit more, absolutely. But my, my understanding is it's all about where the rest of the time. And hopefully, and I know we've had this conversation, we hope that there's a connection between the residents and the residents who work in the city. Is the discussion creating a parking lot? Yeah, that's one of the yeah, I think that's one of the things we want to we want to identify. What what are the methods to provide the supply level? So I think that our parking the, the challenge with increasing parking requirements in the central business district in families is twofold. One, it's a significant impact on the feasibility of redevelopment in our downtown. It has been probably the number one driver for investment in our towns. Among other things, it's, it's a really important aspect. Um, so changing that will affect feasibility of sort of growth we're seeing downtown. But secondly, I think for, for me, more importantly in the long term, is if we're increasing parking requirements in the downtown, that means now the ground floor is likely to be a parking structure. And that does not make for a vibrant, active, walkable commercial center. Uh, and if we're going to kind of continue redevelopment of our downtown, that is going to make it a destination and a deep, vibrant, mixed-use uh, commercial district. We've got to make sure that there's active ground floor uses. So 
um, we're, we're looking at things as part of a distributed approach for municipal parking and utilizing existing parking to create, create supply there. You know, and, 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 and sort of unique. Tell us they circle around a while before they can There's absolutely a question. And we're not alone in that <clears throat> dynamic. I think other gaming states have the same conundrum of wanting to uh, encourage first floor retail commercial active downtowns. And then once you get to a little bit of momentum, having this parking issue. And so um, we're coordinating with other communities through Mass Saint to try to support a state investment in like, structured parking in Gay City downtowns um, as a way to, to increase supply. In, in it's consistent with their the economic development aspect. So, um, Colin, uh, I, I love tossing uh, curveballs at people. Uh, Jim, I see you in the room. Uh, we have Jim Cowdell here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was wondering if you could comment a little from the EDIC perspective on some of the zoning changes um, uh, on both sides, the economic development one, as well as the complete dairy zoning one, um, how you see this kind of impacting from an economic standpoint? Um, well, first on the affordable housing component, your question regarding the process and bringing the people to water and sewer and other housing. So the, the ordinance that's, that's coming up before the council Tuesday night, it's been in the process for about two years now. You know, when you look at the housing plan and all the work that the housing authority the steering committee. I've never seen such an inclusive process. So it wasn't just like a school faculty community. It was the business community that came to public meetings. It was the uh, residents. It was the elected officials. It's been a for two years. So the process that brought us here, I, I think, has been awesome. Um, from, from where I sit, from, guess how many cities in Massachusetts have an affordable housing? 200. 200. So, so when I'm saying with developers, you know, and, and I'm so proud to say that the development found it and it's developer, you know, you look at me where they have Salem, Beverly, Boston, everywhere you point as an inclusion of the So, so this isn't new, right? Um, so the process has been good. The developers that have had a meeting with us are very comfortable with this because that's what they're used to doing. And so the Boston developers are uh, like Samuel, for example, coming to invest in land on the waterfront, do not blink when we talk about it. So um, I support it. It's been part of the housing plan that was adopted by the city. And so your point is a good one. We got the process. All the stakeholders have been involved. In this. So on the economic development side, I think it's been great. When we had that developers, we had 70 people come. Because of activity, we want other companies. We need jobs. Um, but when we took the developers down to the vacant lot lot on Federal Street, that would not be an eligible use to them in a special permit. So, so Aaron, who's the expert in zoning, back of this, it, it makes it easier for, for a company to locate. Um, and so, it, it's, to me, it's a no-brainer. So, I, I, where I sit, I support both sides. How much interface will you have with the tenant community? With the tenant community? Yeah. Or in the yeah. uh, people applying to you the contract is not special. Right. I think so annually uh, the property owner, the property manager would be submitting uh, report to the planning department, which is a copy to have. Uh, and what they do to be just a, just a spreadsheet that has a tenant income level to show that that they're meeting the income requirements, not earning more than it's allowed under federal requirements, um, and they're confirming that the rent is set. You have to submit that to the department annually. Uh, pretty standard, it's a standard practice. And then as needed, there's always opportunities sort of not to audit that. We we'll call it a uh, uh, it's probably a little bit strong, but you know, it's basically the check in for a spot, basically. But if the, the reporting is done, that's the problem. So, people return out of the system, the there, yeah, over time, yeah, like, that's a possibility. Yeah, they, they, there is a period of time under, under the recovery that, as you earn more than the tax 
limit is you're not kicked out immediately. There is a transition. The idea is to make that housing available for eligible households. Let me deal with condominiums. Yeah, condominiums. So uh, they're for ownership units. Do we use those hot guidelines that we saw those rent numbers? You can back that into a, a essentially a, a sale price. Um, LM does that a lot with a lot of their townhouses that are being sold right now. You set a sale price where, whereby the mortgage, which includes principal, interest, then insurance, is not above that that max. You set the you set the sale price. Have we considered having the housing authority on them? On them? Yeah. Um, we haven't talked about that. I think the the, the, the ownership would be the individual would be the household. There would, there would be um, a process where uh, it's usually a lottery that, that goes out. Um, prospective buyers would go through the process of demonstrating that they're eligible to, to purchase the property um, and then purchase it. There's a deed writer that sticks to the property to ensure that that, that affordability sticks out. Um, that's a case where if someone makes more money, they own it. So it is, it is what it is. But what happens is, at the sale, at the sale time, to sell the property, um, you know, it has to be sold at that affordable, affordable rate in the future. That's how you maintain the point. Also, the only other change is on the in lieu fee, where we talked about the value gap process is a little bit different. Where you're looking at the rent, and the difference between market and affordable divided by not the cap rate. It's, it's simpler in an afford in a housing ownership unit, whereby it's just the market price minus the affordable. You don't need to you don't need to go through the process of uh, cap rate for that. Okay. It's a lot of math. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm sure. Just just wondering what about the fact that I over and um Right, right. It would be a little bit punitive to, to require someone to go about in the right. to make it. To make it. Well, are there any questions from the Zoomer? Any Zoom questions? You can raise your hand or unmute yourself. Looks like no. Um, guys, thank you so much for coming. It's, it's nice to meet you. Actually, it's on time. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mayor Nicholson. Any closing comments you'd like to offer? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I really appreciate the chamber's uh, invitation um, to talk about this. Please feel free to follow up with, with me and my team. Jim, um, if you have any questions that we can get to, they can stop the questions. You know, I think that uh, as a, as a, as a, a community, we have some real needs that we all want to work together to address. And, and one of them is, is the cost of housing. And that comes up. We see that in the schools and in housing insecurity for our, our families. Um, we see that in talking to public safety about, uh, you know, issues that folks are having in some of these uh, apartment buildings. And, <clears throat> We're going to address all these needs. We, we need to find a way to grow in a positive way, to encourage the right kind of growth um, that creates good paying jobs for one residents. Uh, and that's what this is about. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.